Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here in studio with my partner in crime, the intrepid Scott Bernstein. Hey now. And Benny behind the glass, the, the engineer. Um, just want to remind everyone uh, to please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our audio podcast on Spotify, Google, on Apple, and please spread the word. We appreciate your comments and, and the kind words, and we thank you for your support. And before we get into our topic today, I also wanted to uh, just take a moment and expand on something that Scott and our friend Jeff Nadu were talking about on last week's episode, and I, I appreciate Jeff filling in for me. And um, they talked about collaboration with other content creators, and um, I think that that's important. And I think there's some content creators out there that sort of their seems like their purpose is to cut down other content creators more adversarial yeah right adversarial and, and antagonistic and and we try not to do that and we get along with a lot of the other content creators so obviously jeff is a friend of ours the sit down podcast and he's been on our show before you've gone on his show before you've gone on uh you've collaborated with rj who's a big john panisi and panisi. his sit down news uh yeah. george anastasia and dave schratweiser and their mob talk sit yeah. down um yeah, so we, uh, we, we're more collaborative and inclusive, I think, in our approach. And then we, you know, we don't view this as a zero-sum game where, it, you know, like it's traditional radio or traditional television where it's, you know, CBS against NBC right. or, Ratings. <laughs> you know, cumulus media uh, uh, versus uh, intercom radio or, or uh, Westwood One or uh, uh, iHeartRadio. It, it's not... Uh, if one person wins, it doesn't mean the other person has to lose. Yeah, I agree. So I think that's important to point out. And and we've um I've I went on uh, Tom Lavecchia's show a few weeks ago, Armchair MBA, and um I've gone on the Mob Archaeologist show. Please check them out. They're good friends of ours. Uh, Angelo, Tony, Rick, Eric. Those guys do a, a great job. Um, shout out to Mr. Big, aka Milwaukee Mob. He's he's always been a, a big supporter of ours. Uh, Big Wayne, check out his books. And 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 even like you're saying, even guys in the life, John Panisi, Michael Francis, they've been on our show before. On the other side of the, Bo you know, Bo Bobby Gary Jenkins, uh, yeah, and Boston Bobby Luisi, Bobby, right. So we we I think that's important to keep that collaborative spirit. That's how it's supposed to be in academia, and I think it's it's nice that it's also happening with us with these other content creators. So. Anyhow, just, just wanted to shout out those other friends of ours. Um, we've got a, a good episode today. Um, unfortunately, some, some people have passed on, some, some big names in the underworld. And we're going to talk about a few of them, but the, definitely the, the biggest name is um, Chicky Changalini from Philadelphia, who was really the definition, just like on Scott's hat, an, an OG. Um, I believe he was almost 90 years old, what, 88? Yeah, 88. And uh, he's like was like this elder statesman of the underworld, but he he goes back a long way. He was he was a captain under Scarfo, and his his family is involved. You know, his sons have been involved in the life. So um, we we want to talk about his life and legacy, just like we did a few weeks ago with, with Jimmy I, and we do this sometimes, sort of a, an obituary, if you will. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Scott, his legacy is a lot less complicated yes, than Jimmy right. I, in in the light of the news that broke on Jimmy I's uh, right uh, wake about the uh, the document that claimed he was an informant. I, just to give a quick update on that, yeah, yeah, uh, I was able to confirm that that document. There was a lot of speculation about what that meant. Was he still cooperating after that document was drafted? I was able to talk to people that were uh, familiar with the document specifically, as well as how those documents uh, were drafted and what they meant. And that was a, a document or that was a reference to a closed informant. So when that was drafted, I believe in 1979 or 1980, Dino had already been closed, according to the FBI. Interesting. Um, the, 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 um, the, the letter and number next to his name would have been different. It would have mm. said CI or CW or CL. It just said C, which according to the people I talked to stood for closed. Um, and then I just think there's some contextual things that if you check out Gangster Report, you know, you'll be able to learn. But I think that's most important uh, in terms of what we've talked about here, that whatever the context was with his alleged information giving to the FBI in the 60s and 70s when he was a guy in his yeah. 30s, right. 20s, 30s. Um, it doesn't look like there's any evidence that there was 
any type of information gathering on the FBI side from Jimmy I going forward, you know, past the 70s. And I know there was a lot of people that were kind of running. A lot of the media outlets were running rampant with speculation that, you know, he, he was cooperating up until the week that he died. Sure. That I think that we at least I feel like I've. Put that to bed, at least 99 percent certainty that that was not the case. Yeah. And uh, I just want I just think that that's only fair to put out there when, when you're talking about Jimmy I in, in the wake of that news breaking on uh, on the week that he died. But Chicky. Yeah. Different. Story. It's, it's a lot different. You know, Chicky is um, stone cold gangster. Right. And, you know, he was the South Philly OG. I mean, there's a lot of OGs in Philadelphia. I mean, there are. Literally, you know, more than a dozen guys that you'd probably refer to as an OG in the in the Bruno Scarfo family. But the pinnacle of that OG pyramid uh, up until uh, last Saturday night on March 11th uh, was Joseph Chicky Cangolini Sr. Very easily, I think, could have become a boss, a godfather, uh, like some of these other guys we've talked about that we that we focus on here in, in the OG podcast. The, the best of the best in this in this world of of gangland politics and power, uh, the way that power moves up and down and vertically, horizontally and what have you. You know, if you if you can check those three boxes that, that what I call, you know, that that trifecta of beloved, feared and respected. Yeah. Um, you can go very far in, in that world. And, and Joe and, and Joseph Sr., a.k.a. Chicky. Um, he checked all those boxes and uh, he had to do 30 years in prison for it and kept his mouth shut and uh, swallowed that 30 years lost uh, from his basically from his 50s in you know, to his 80s, came out nine years ago and, and uh, got to live his best life his last decade and uh, wasn't traditionally active, but was a guy that wasn't hard to find in South Philly, uh, would spend al- almost every day, if not every day at Stogie Joe's, which is a, a popular tavern, uh, on a South Philly street corner. And uh, he'd get there at nine, 10 in the morning and be reading his paper. Still like the, the old school, the old school, <laughs> hard copy newspaper. Yeah. Uh, and he'd be out there having his coffee, uh, early, early in the day. And he'd stay there till, uh, after dinner. So uh, it was known that you could go find Chicky and, and get his counsel and and pay your respects. Like the Don. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I, I don't think he was, there was a lot of questions when he came out of prison in 14, because 2014, when that the Philadelphia family was in somewhat of a transitional phase, because you had all of these Scarfo era guys that were coming out after 20 plus years, and you had all these Merlino era guys that were coming out after 10 years. And there was, I think, worry that, that that there could be some flare-ups there um and that chicky could be one of the people that bridged the gap and maybe he did but there never really was a, any flare-ups yeah and chicky uh if he ever was an underboss or a conciliary it was probably just you know acting post for you know kind of stopgap measures kind of like emeritus yeah kind of thing can we let's 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 rewind that because we want to talk about his, his life too Let's let's rewind to like the beginning, like like on the come up, because yeah. he was an interesting dude, like his affiliations with Scarfo and he was a hitter muscle. Yeah, he was. Te- well, he came up in the Teamsters. Yeah. OK. In, yeah. In let's, the late 50s, in the late 50s, early 60s, he got an, a reputation for being, you know, a, a, a union goon yeah. <laughs> and someone that kept people in line and uh, a knee buster. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he was a, a big, burly guy. Dark complected. I've heard a lot of guys that knew Chicky that referred to him as thick blooded. Um, he would get hot really easily. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, like, liter- not, not figuratively, like hot, you know, as a temper, but like physically, he would get hot easily. Mm-hmm. And he was known for someone that uh, always wanted to have the windows open when he drove the car and always wanted to have the air conditioning on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, he, he was made a name for himself in the Teamsters before he made a name for himself in the mafia. He started to get on the FBI's radar uh, in the 
late 60s, early 70s, when he was, according to the government, was the, the top lieutenant or right-hand man to a powerful and, and very duplicitous and dangerous uh, copper regime known, known as Frank Sindone or the Barracuda. And Chicky ran his, uh, his gambling, his loan sharking, his, his, his shakedowns. And uh, the Barracuda was a co-conspirator in the assassination of Angela Bruno in 1980, uh, which was unsanctioned. And uh, the, the conspirators were marked for death. And I think one of the best lines in Goodfellas is, it's not like in the movies where, you know, guys with masks uh, come for you and break into your house to kill you. It's your best friends that come with a smile on the face yeah. who are the ones sent to kill you. And uh, with, according to the government, he was never convicted of this or charged with it. Uh, according to the government in, in intelligence memos that I've seen, uh, it's believed that Chicky Changalini was given the murder contract on Sindone, his, his boss, his mentor. Uh, he carried that out and took over that crew so then that's how he so then he was good with testa and scarf yes and then he became a capo and became one of their top guys right and helped keep everything in line and and as stabilized as it could be after that destabilizing period of 1980 and 81 when first bruno was killed and then his underboss phil testa was killed a year later was sindone i mean was he Integral to that conspiracy? He was integral Tony, to the Bruno conspiracy. Yeah, with Tony Bananas. Yeah, he guy. thought he was going to become the underboss. Okay. But Caponegro was going to become boss, and right. Sindone uh, would become underboss. Um, and then with Testa, Chicky Narducci thought that he would become right. underboss. Yeah. So the two Chickies, we talked about that he on a text the thread. Too. There were two, you know, there was the city of Philadelphia was only big enough for two, for, for one Chickie <laughs> in the 80s. There were two of them. One of them got killed in 82, and then Chicky Changalini lasted until this week. So in terms of protocol, if Sindone is in on this conspiracy, and he was, he's not going to share that with his underlings. Yes, yeah, right? I, I don't know what, it's interesting to ask that question. Like, yeah. if you were Sindone's right hand. How much did you know? And Sindone is critical to this power play that Tony Caponegro was pulling. He was... Bruno's consigliere, uh, consigliere. Uh, I would guess that he knew. <laughs> yeah. And, you but know, you can get right by doing what? Right. Allegedly. Right. Because well, that right. was the, they want the person closest to you to be able to either rein you in and bring you in to get in line with the new regime or to take you out. Yeah. Yeah. So, so either way, he, he, he made it right, even if he, even if he had some insight yeah. in that situation. And, but what's you know, interesting in the way that uh, you know, fate plays a role and how things evolve and how, how, how crime families, how power ebbs and flows, you know, he, the stuff that was going on during the Bruno era, Chicky had to account for uh, legally. Mm-hmm. And uh, took a case in the early 80s that really had nothing to do with what he was doing under Scarfo. Uh, but it was happening during the early years of the Scarfo regime, which ended up, ended, ended up putting Chicky away before most of the Scarfo era guys went away. I think Chicky got locked up in 84, I believe. Uh, most of the Scarfo era guys were off the street by early 87. What was it? What did he get pinched for? Back it was a, ra it was a racketeering case okay. uh, involving uh, extortion, gambling. I think that were, there was a murder uh, that was rolled into it. I think that might have been two separate cases that were uh, rolled into one that he, he served concurrent sentences in. He was a suspect in at least... Uh, Three other murders besides Sindone, uh, the Johnny Calabrese murder from 1981, which happened in South Philly, uh, the Alvin Feldman murder uh, from the 70s, where he, according to FBI informants, Chicky ice picked Alvin Feldman to death and nobody's ever found Alvin Feldman's body. He was a Jewish 
racketeer drug dealer close with the Scarfo group. That's just to send you a message. It means Luca Brasi sleeps with the fishes. <laughs> Yes, well exactly, done. exactly. Well done. Was he not kicking up or something? What was you know? I don't know what the beef with was? Feldman was exactly. I know the Calabrese murder was related to Nicky Scarfo taking over as boss in the spring of eighty one and trying to get everybody in line. Yeah. And Calabrese was a guy that wasn't getting in line. Oh. Was not sharing drug proceeds and and uh, bookmaking proceeds and whatnot. Yeah. Um. And Scarfo had a like no. Uh, no independence right like it right that was bruno uh, had independence bruno was like yeah you can be independent as long as you you know send a present to me every christmas right and if you and if and if um and if you were one of these guys that were holding out scarfo had no compunction about we'll just we'll just whack the fucking guy and out. do it cowboy style right leave him right. in the street and we don't need to negotiate like <laughs> it's just fucking whack. which was out. a huge contrast to what was going on under angelo bruno now i think there's been a misnomer with this tag that he's gotten, you know, historically in the narrative that he was the docile Don or that yeah. he, w- he wasn't a, a, a peace first mafia boss. He was less bloodthirsty than some of the other East coast mob bosses, Sure, but that didn't mean that he wasn't quick to order murders. And he ordered quite a few. Yes. Uh, now he did. He got the reputation because he allowed a guy that had tried to kill him early in his reign um, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Miggs, Antonio Polina, I believe, uh, was one of the guys oh. who was the Joe Ida guy. Yeah, those were older. Yeah, these were the old guys. timers that, yeah, that t- had to leave the country after Appalachian. Yeah, and right. then Bruno was moving into power. And there was another guy that wanted power. I think it was Polina and it was somebody else. Uh, it, it, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but it was yeah. Polina and somebody else. And, uh, Basically, it was a a bloodless power struggle that eventually could have, I shouldn't say eventually, but possibly could have resulted in murders because they wanted to murder Bruno. Bruno got tipped off to it, went to New York, got the okay to to take over, and was given the the choice whether or not he wanted to kill these guys or put them on the shelf, vanquish them, and he decided to put them on the shelf. Uh, at which got him the reputation of being a um, merciful yeah. godfather. Yeah. Well, and, and he also did give his guys, um, it seems like a more, I don't know if independence. Autonomy. Is the word, but yeah. You know, unlike Scarfo, where he, everyone had to. Um, but he uh, wasn't killing people in the streets. No. He was conscious of uh, public relations in a way that Nikki Scarfo. I, well, I think Nikki Scarfo was aware of public <laughs> the way public relations played too. I think they just had two very different approaches. Yeah, Scarfo like being like a gaudy. Want, well, wanted to use the optics of of doing his hits cowboy style, and he told his this wasn't like a something that people intuited. <laughs> like yeah. He was yeah. when we he when he would address his troops, he's the way we kill people. We do it cowboy style. We leave them in the street. Right. Um. We don't want to do what what. Uh, what was done in our crime family in the past where either guys disappeared or they were found in trunks of cars. Right. Um, but right. so, so the, the, the hits were very brazen and it was a stark contrast to what had been going on the previous 20 years. And it all started with Bruno's assassination, which was brazen. And then Testa getting blown up by the pipe bomb, which was famously written about by Bruce Springsteen in the um, song Atlantic city. But I think Bruno was old school in the sense of you like uh, to use a cliche here, Right, George Anastasia. You make money, not headlines. Not headlines, right? <laughs> and that was, but there was some truth to that, even yeah. though it's cliche. Um, and uh, Scarfo, like, like both. So Chicky helped get uh, everybody in line under under Scarfo, and then uh, right before he got locked up, there was a murder of an independent drug dealer named Bobby Hornickel. I don't know what the specifics of that were, but it's uh, informants allege that he ordered that. Um, with the Calabrese thing, I believe he was involved in the setup, uh, but wasn't involved in the actual murder. With Sindone and with Alvin Feldman, the allegations are that uh, Chicky was, you know, got his hands dirty. So when he gets sentenced, what did you say? It was 84? I believe, it, yeah, he got hit in 84. That He got hit again in the 87 case that took down Scarfo, but he was already nailed for the 
case that he uh, got convicted of for what he had done under Bruno and Testa. So in 84, was that when he does his big stint or not yet? Yeah, he goes in in 84 and he, and he isn't, doesn't come out until 2014. Okay. All right. And uh, when he's inside is when, you know, the very Shakespearean um, aspects of, of his legacy start to play a, play a part. And you have his three sons fall on different sides of a faction war that erupts in the 1990s between today's Philadelphia mob Don, Skinny Joey Merlino, and the Sicilian Don that got put in, who was a part of the Bruno murder conspiracy, got a free pass because of his connection to the New York Five families and then was installed as the godfather after Nicky Scarfa goes away. And you have all these guys that were the sons and nephews of Scarfa lieutenants, yeah, Merlino. led by Merlino, who was Scarfa's underboss's son, and Mikey Cangolini, who was Merlino's best friend, and Chicky Cangolini's son. Um, Those three, his three sons in 84 would not have been made yet. They would have been. No, yeah, young. none of them got made. And there's actually a famous photo. I don't know if it's a still from a, uh, a local news television footage or if it's a photo from a newspaper, but it's from Chicky going into court, I believe in 83 for his case. And he's got his three sons with him. Yeah. And they are all kind of like, or at least one of them is like combing his hair and the other one's like popping his collar. And they're at that time, they're all in their 20s. And it's like, the picture of a, a, a mafia family and fast forward 10 years, literally 10 years. And it's like someone took a sledgehammer yeah. uh, to that photo. And you had, you literally had brothers trying to kill brothers. Um, and, not, and not just trying succeeding in one, right. one case. Uh, and uh, it's just one of the most compelling mafia uh, a- a- anecdotes or, or, or situations of, of the last 50 years, what happened with the Cangolini family and how it intertwined in that power struggle of, of the 1990s. And I, I think that I've been able to uncover some insight that, and George Anastasia has, has done such an amazing job of chronicling all of that. And I wouldn't know any of what I know if it wasn't for his reporting. And his so, books. Right. And his, so anything that I report, it's just it's because he laid the groundwork for. But uh, I think I've been able to shed some fresh insight on what Chicky was advising from behind bars, because there was a belief um, that both Chicky and Chucky Merlino, Joey's dad, were like coaching this younger faction and encouraging them and pressing them to go to war with Stampha. Yeah. And I can't speak to what Chucky Merlino was telling Joey and Joey also had Ralph Natale in his ear, but I've been able in my reporting and people I've talked to, I've been able to destroy this narrative that it, that had emerged that Chicky was somehow subversive, right? Or Chicky was backing one brother or one son against another son when what I heard, oh, for people that might not know, uh, so you had Mikey Chang yeah, was on one down, side. Yeah, explain the politics of it. I know we've talked about it in other yeah, episodes. Maybe but, people don't know. Yeah. Joey Chang, who's the namesake of Chicky, Joseph Changalini Jr., was named underboss to Stampha. Stampha named him his number two as in, in theory, as a, like an olive branch to the, to the Changolinis and Merlinos to come underneath Stampha's banner. Now, Mike, er, so Mikey Chang is with Joey. Joey Chang is with John Stampha. And then Johnny Chang, who's the brother that is the, really the, the peacekeeping brother between Joey Chang and Mikey Chang, is locked up with dad. And you have without Chicky on the, on the street and without Johnny Chang on the street, 
you had two brothers in Joey and Mikey who I guess there was a lot of animosity from when they were kids. Uh, they had never gotten along, I guess, the way that maybe Joey got along with Johnny and Mikey got along with Johnny. Joey and Mikey didn't get along as well. So I think it was a miscalculation or proved to be a miscalculation by Stampa that putting in a guy that even though it was a brother to Mikey Chang, but someone that Mikey Chang didn't always see eye to eye with uh, was the, was the cure all. Right. He couldn't, he couldn't rein in. The idea the, was that Joey yeah. Chang could rein in his, his brother, brother right. and Joey Merlino. Right. And that was, wasn't accounting for the force of nature that Mikey Chang was, who was yeah. a different breed than any of the three brothers. He was, I mean, he was like a, a, a hurricane. And um, according to some sources on the street, there's even this idea that he may have been the, the, the ringleader. More, more so than, than Joey. More was. so than Joey, at least in the early, early days. I think they both had a lot of ambition at a really young age. Um, one, another, uh, I, this wasn't necessarily a misnomer, but I think it was kind of a lost fact that I, I was able to get my hands on some FBI files and, and report this re or in the last couple of years. But Joey and Mikey Chang were plotting this takeover of Philly within weeks of Scarfo and those guys going to prison. Like they go into prison in March of 87 and I got FBI documents from April of 87 with a 27 year old Joey. I was going to say they're real young. Yeah. Dudes and Mikey point. Chang going around to spots and them letting these people that had been paying tribute to Scarfo to know, Hey, now you're, now you're paying us. So the, the, it wasn't in 91 or 92. Uh, when the war broke out, it had been bubbling for about five years. So I, I really want to get into the minutia of this. <laughs> I know, but it, it, it's, I think it's fun. And it's, it's, one, it's a fun thing about doing this kind of show. So New York, why do the, again, we've talked about in other episodes, but it's fun to revisit, I think. Why is New York backing Stanford? Is it because they think that these guys are too young and yeah. inexperienced? Chang and Merlino, like, is, I mean, why? And they had nobody vouching for them until Ralph Natale, or I think Ralph eventually gave them that backing in New York. Mm -hmm. And Ralph Natale was an old school Bruno guy that had been like a hitman and a labor fixer, arsonist, drug dealer, goes to prison, gets put in a cell with Joey Merlino. And I think they, I, I don't think, I know, they both saw a way to use the other to their respective benefits. Right. Joey needed someone to politic with him with the old school guys. And Ralph had made a lot of connections with the New Yorkers in his 15 years in prison. Um, and specifically the Chin and Gotti and uh, Junior Persico. And uh, you had... Joey, or sorry, you had Ralph who needed muscle on the street to do what he wanted to do, which was take over the family. I, I don't think he cared that it was kind of a name only. He, he wanted right. the title of Godfather. Sure. So they kind of hatched this plan behind bars. But it, like I said, I, I think it's been lost that that plan was already percolating before Joey ever got to prison. Joey had to serve a I think three years for a truck heist, a, a, um, a uh, armored, armored car heist where he stole like $350,000 from a, a, a bank, uh, a, 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 an armored bank car that he had a deal with the person that was driving the car to drop the money. So it wasn't like he came in with a gun. Right. Like they dropped it somewhere where they just came, where the Joey and some other guys just came and picked it up. And then Joey stole all the money, didn't give any of his, his co-conspirators any of the, the cash. And then I think the guy that was the inside man with the armored car company gave them Snitched up. Snitched them up, yeah. yeah. So now when, when Joe, I know uh, these guys have the same first names. When Joey Chang, when Stampha makes this, uh, make you Soto Capo, at that point, so he's all bought in then. At this point, he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm Stampha's guy then now. 
Yeah. Like, even though my brother and my guys I grew up with, whatever, he's all Stanford in. Stanford was making him underboss. So that's, yeah. I don't, think, I don't think Joey Merlino or, or Mikey Chang had planned to make Joey Chang. <laughs> right. Maybe they, had, maybe they had planned to give him a capo spot. I don't know. But I don't think he was going to be in the administration. And do, what do you think? Obviously, this is speculative. But you, you know this area. You talk to a lot of people. Do we, do we know anything about his mindset at that point? Is Joey Chang confident that he can rein in his brother and the young guys? Or what, I wonder what his Yeah, I don't know. Is. I know that. Uh, in terms of leadership. This you know? was in the wake. What. What. Snap Stanford to attention was the fact that the Merlino, Mikey Chang, Ralph Natale faction had killed Stanford's number two, uh, Little Felix Bacchino, who was another co-conspirator yeah. in the Bruno hit 12 years before that. Um, and even though Little Felix wasn't officially Stanford's underboss, um, he was acting as it. And I think the belief was he was a, going to be named underboss, but he was acting as Stanford's uh, liaison to the street, getting, trying to get everybody in line under Stanford. And Bakchino gets hit in early 92. And Merlino gets out of prison. And that's when Stanford figures, I'd rather make peace with these guys than go to war with them. He actually, Stanford actually makes Joey Merlino and Mikey Chang, but he had made Joey Chang before. Okay. He made Joey Chang in like 90 or 91. So they had this pre-existing relationship. So with, so when Mikey Chang is opposing Stanford, Joey Chang's got a one up on his brother. I got my button. You don't. Yes. Right. That might've fed into some of that resentment. I, I'm just yeah. Well, I think course, it did. But, yeah. So, Mikey and Joey Merlino agree and they get made and Joey Chang becomes underboss and like everything was copacetic for like three months. I mean, it fell apart real fast uh, and it fell apart because if you believe Mikey Chang, it's the spring of 92 and, or sorry, spring of 93 and or winter 93 actually and and uh, uh or at some point it's either some point in early 93 or late 92 uh mikey chang is coming back from a basketball game that he had played at a local park and he's going to his house where his uh, his family's there his young wife his daughters and his young son and he's coming back like in his basketball gear and two guys pop out of, uh, of a car with shotguns he's Mikey Chang swore one of the guys with shotguns was Joey Chang. Um, and they light him up or light the house up. They don't hit Joey Chang, but they pepper the house with shotgun bullets. He's him and his wife are diving to protect the kids. And it just erupts from that point forward where he thinks my brother tried to kill me and he tried to do it in front of my little kids and my yeah, wife and his, could have killed my little kids right, and my wife. Own, in the his own yeah. nieces and nephew. So then a couple uh, either again, I'm, I'm messing up the timeline here, but within the next couple w weeks or months, you have the only mob hit ever caught on surveillance tape, which was Joey Merlino and Mikey Chang going to where Joey Chang worked at six o'clock in the morning because the FBI was surveillance was had surveillance on the place, which was a diner in an industrial area of, of Philadelphia. And Joey Chang seems like, a, you know, he wasn't one of these guys that was uh, out till five in the morning right. and sleeping till three in the afternoon and then getting into he's he's going in and opening this place up at five o'clock, six o'clock in the morning and working behind the, yeah. the counter at a diner. And they know that. And so the FBI has got a surveillance video up right outside of the diner and they caught this hit team rolling up, going in there. And like unloading multiple clips in, into Joey Chang. Uh, and miraculously, Joey Chang survives, but he's, he's paralyzed. Isn't he? I don't I think he was paralyzed, but he's disabled and has never been the same since, you know, can't, uh, he's got to walk with a cane and just, it ended his life in the mob. 
By the way, if I were a made guy, I would definitely be the guy who stays up till six right. in the morning. Yeah, right. <laughs> I wouldn't be the guy waking. What's the, the point afternoon? of being the underboss right. <laughs> if you got to wake up at six o'clock to open up your restaurant? <laughs> right. So, I, I, I mean, it's a very serious situation. So, I but, but check, what but. I think there was this this false narrative that made it out, and, and and it's hard to when you're reporting in real time. So, I'm not blaming anybody for the false narrative. I mean, I I can get why. <laughs> You would believe that uh, Chucky Merlino and Chicky Changalini were, were coaching Joey and Mikey from the sidelines, when in reality, I'm told that it was relayed in a very firm manner that Chicky was telling Mikey to calm the fuck down and telling Joey, you and Mikey, go, the boss is the boss, John Stanford's your boss, and get in line and be La Cosa Nostra. Kind yeah. of like Anthony or uh, like uh, Neil De La Croce yeah. or the actor playing Neil De La Croce Anthony in Quinn, and yeah. Anthony Quinn playing him in the movie Gotti. Yeah, the right. Um, and if if the boss says you got to go, I'd come in here with these two zips. <laughs> and you would go. <laughs> um, but so so what access at, like in between the, the 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 shooting of Mikey, attempted murder of him. What what kind of access do they have to their father in prison? And they're the sons. Now, they have visitation rights? I know they were visiting Ralph on a regular basis. Ralph at that point was in federal prison, but he was in either Pennsylvania or New he Jersey. Was he was really close. Yeah, okay. And they would have frequent visits with Ralph. I think the, con- I think the um, contact with Chicky was coming through intermediaries and phone calls. Because I just wonder what... He's thinking if he's getting reports that that things are getting really tense between his two sons, what he's what he's thinking. Well, there's there's actual recordings of Johnny in prison pleading with both of his brothers to cool off until I come home and I'll fix it. And he's telling Mikey, please, please just wait. I'll be home in six months. I'll be home in eight months. And just don't do anything crazy. Like, go try to kill your brother at his diner. Now, do we know, because the way they're viewing it is it's retaliation. Um, How confident are you in Mikey Chang's theory that his brother was indeed one of the shooters? I I believe that's probably true. Okay. So he's, so so Joey's guilty here too. Joey Chang of like, and what's his motive to... This is coming from Stampha, or do you yeah. think this is a personal thing? I think it was coming from Stampha, and he was willing to take out his own brother. So, so Stampha really sort of like is, is Machiavelli, and like yeah. he, he wants Merlino, and then we're going to make you, we're going to make your brother right. under boss. And then it he, was all, it was all a con. And then, but as soon as you guys yeah. let your guard down, I'm right. going to fucking whack you guys yes. out. So, and the, the woman that was at the diner that was the, the waitress who was opening, who would open every morning with Joey Chang was the wife of one of Stanford soldiers, a uh, gate Luchabello, who, because of that flip sides. Oh, and wow. now to this day, he's been one of, uh, you know, Joey Merlino's, uh, main guys. So, so, um, I mean, I guess it, it definitely puts Mikey Chang in a difficult spot. Even if his brother and his dad are telling him, chill out if his own brother tried to kill him in front of his family you can you can understand why and and mikey was you know everyone talks about joey and and joey is a a phenomena and and someone that is as iconic as iconic can be people will be writing and talking about joey merlino for 100 years mikey chang if you would have had time to have his legacy play out um he was you know, Joey's a pretty laid back dude. I mean, I don't think you want to get on his bad side, but Joey's pretty chill. Mm-hmm. Um, his reputation was really fun. Yeah. Guy. Mikey was around. not from what I've, you know, people was not chill. Like Mikey was more like Joe Pesci from, Tense. from Goodfellas and could go from zero. to I'll go home and get your fucking <laughs> shine box. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> could go from zero to a hundred in, in the blink of an eye, and it didn't matter if you were his best friend or your worst at, or, or his worst enemy. Yeah. So, so now then, there's retaliation for so both camps. So at this point, like both camps are, you know, bunker style, and the, the FBI is 
got the South Philly on lockdown, the news. I mean, Jimmy, you, you said you remember going sure. out to Philly in this yeah. time period, 91, 92, 93. Uh, and the and the newspapers are are reporting it on a daily basis. Yeah, the news, the television news is reporting on it. Uh, people aren't living in their houses; they're living in safe houses. And when anybody's traveling, they're traveling with weapons, which gives them, you know, makes them an easy target uh, to get to get pinched. Yeah. Uh, so the Merlino Changalini crew uh, takes over an old Greenpeace storefront that was like a Nonprofit Save the Whales. I was just going to say it's ironic. Back uh, in the eighties, and uh, they get a hold of the storefront and make it, and and they kind of they black out the, uh, the windows, and they make it their base camp for the war. And uh, people knew that's where they would. Maybe they weren't sleeping there, but people knew they were there during the day. These guys didn't have jobs. Uh, So August 93, which is about five months after Joey Chang is shot and maimed, uh, Joey Merlino and Mikey Chang are smoking a cigarette and going to get, I believe, going to grab lunch outside of that clubhouse. Uh, I think it was on Catherine Street in South Philly. And two of Stanford's hitmen are doing, you know, are, are... circling the neighborhood looking for people in the Merlino Changalini camp to kill. And they come across the two main targets and they, they open fire in a drive-by uh, Joey Merlino gets hit in the butt. Mikey Chang only gets hit once, but it gets hit right through the heart. Mm-hmm. And uh, he dies in Joey Merlino's arms. And like I said, this is, this is very Shakespearean, and I'm, I'm actually shocked that we're sitting here 30 years from removed from this, and there really has not been any dramatic or scripted yeah. um, recreation of, of these events. There was a, a really bad B-movie called uh, Tenth and Wolf with yeah, Giovanni right. Ribisi. Yeah. We, yeah. Talking, some parts of it are I, I find it. I actually like it in terms of yeah. it's so, so bad. It's yeah. good. Yeah, some parts um, of it are interesting. But uh, yeah, with with uh, Giovanni Ribisi yeah, playing very uh, based on playing this. Joey uh, Marcucci. Yeah, yeah. Were there and then where the, the idea is like the zip takes over and the right. young well, guys resent it. Well, and Dennis Hopper plays. Oh yeah, like yeah. the Nicky Scarfo character yeah, right. who gets killed by the Sicilian, which right. they're you know they're playing with the the facts. Right, right. And then uh, Merlino takes over, or Joey Marcucci yeah. takes over by killing. Or goes to work for the Sicilian and then kills the Sicilian. Right, Giovanni uh, Ribisi. He's, right. he's actually not bad. Is that, yeah, yeah I mean, it's 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 and then it's cute. Uh, and then one of the reasons why it's uh, known as a B movie is Tommy Lee from Molly. Crow. Tommy <laughs> Lee's in cameo. it. Yeah, <laughs> he plays one of the soldati. Piper Perabu from Coyote Ugly is the female. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's and then the they they really uh, fictionalize the storyline where James Marsden plays like an old childhood friend right. of this South Philly mob who had left town. They didn't know that he'd become like an FBI agent. Right, he and then he goes back to info. Well, that never really happened. Right. For Which the is, sake of the movie. By the way, isn't that stealing like state Steal, of grace? Yeah. <laughs> stay, right, exactly. <laughs> Premise for state yes, of grace. Right. <laughs> so, but anyhow, so they're, so they, so they get <sighs> retaliation. And then what happens after? Mike? And then, well, then there's a shootout on the expressway. Right. Uh, in the week, less, I think like a week later, uh, Joey Merlino allegedly uh, gets a van and retrofits it with like machine gun turrets. And they they follow Stampha and his bodyguards to work and they come up and, you know, next to him on the expressway and rush hour traffic run morning. August, this always happened in August of 93. And uh, they, 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 they filled the. Uh, the car with bullets and somehow Stanford survived it. His son was shot within a couple of months. Stanford would be indicted, go to prison and Ralph Natale and Joey Merlino would take over. And, uh, Mikey Chang wasn't there to, you know, to, to reap the benefits or, you know, enjoy the fruits of his, his labor and, and, Take it, and taking over a crime family when you're in your 30s. I mean, I think that's what is so remarkable with what happened there, where Joey Merlino, who's still the boss today, if you believe the federal government, he's 60 years old right now, 
and he took over the crime family when he was 30. And that just doesn't Never happen, you know, any during maybe during prohibition, but basically from. Yeah, for that young. Yeah. yeah. Even, even back then, Joe Bonanno was really the only young guy. I think he was 26 when he became boss because Luciano was pretty young, but he wasn't that young. Yeah. When he took over Masseria's. So Merlino Morgana. is really the sh- the puppeteer. Ralph Natale is a lightning rod that's put out in front as a front boss. He's around for about four years, and then he becomes the first uh, sitting mob boss to become a cooperator. And then it's just been the Joy Merlino show. Uh, you know, the, the, he, he wasn't co-starring. He was the, the sure. main star from, from the mid to late 90s till the day. And uh, same guys that were part of this, they called them the Young Turk faction. Um, all guys that were best friends with Mikey Chang, just like Joey, guys that you know came up on the sandbox, came up in the sandbox together. Where and I've said this a lot, and I echo what what Anastasia and Schrettweiser have always said that the elite, these guys have been able to thrive and succeed and sustain in an era where there are so many cooperators because the oath they made to the mafia is a lot less important than the oath they made to each other as you know best friends since they were five six years old yeah because the traditional protocol is if the boss says you kill your best friend you do it um and so back to the like i'm interested in this like kind of a social psychology here it's a very tragic and then johnny story. and then johnny chain comes out of prison yeah, that's what i want to get back and to. he goes underneath you know joey and becomes into this day he's one of uh, joey merlino's uh, top lieutenants and and advisors so that's the old school way which is he doesn't hold a grudge against him for killing his brother or not killing him but, well, but, get, but potentially maybe, getting his brother killed right right but I don't know how much this has been reported. Uh, I think I've talked about it here and there. Chicky Chingalini did not feel the same way from what I can. That, that's, that, that's what I want. How is he processing? Do we have any evidence of how he or insight? Yeah, how is he processing? Is, you know, he blamed uh, what I heard was that he wasn't going to get adversarial with Joey. You got to remember Joey in some ways was like a nephew to Chicky. Uh, Joey, when, when Chicky was rising to prominence, Joey was a teenager and a kid that was around all those guys doing yeah. errands. Yeah. And, uh, his dad was best, you know, one of his, Joey's dad was one of Chicky's best friends. So I don't think Chicky wanted to get adversarial with him, but I've heard from a lot of people that, uh, Chicky blamed Joey for what happened to his, his sons. and. There wasn't a lot of love there. There was respect because sure. Joey was the boss. Um, but you, you wouldn't have found a lot of scenarios in the last decade where Chicky and Joey were hanging out. Mm. Okay. But Johnny was hanging out with Joey a lot. And Johnny was hanging out with his dad a lot. Yeah. But I don't think there was a ton of Joey going to, to Chicky. Um, for, for help or advice, I think the advisory role that Chicky played was more for guys like Stevie Mazzone and Georgie Borghese and Johnny Chang, uh, Mikey Lance, yeah, uh, where he w- would fill kind of an advisor with Joe Legam- Joe Legambi, who was sure. more of a contemporary of, of his. So I'm really interested in this, and I, I'm you know it's obviously it's a family issue, and uh, you know. I, in some ways, I feel odd talking about it because it's their their privacy, but they're they are public fig- figures. Um, even if it's mafia, and there's been books. I mean, right, there's right, been right. books written about this. But it, it just it's so similar to what you see in my particular areas of research, which is this is way more common in Sicily. Yeah, this kind of shit that you see in in the Italian American mafia, where literally within biological families i'm not talking about crime families where guys who are related to each other get split in different factions and in some cases kill each other and and what that does to the uh genealogical family 
and how awkward that becomes in terms of uh, family get-togethers and and holidays and things like that. Do we do we have any insight into like what like the civilians in that family I, I don't, what that did? Yeah, I don't know. I've seen a number of photos over the last decade of Johnny Chang and Chicky, and I know that Johnny spent a lot of time at Stogie Joe's with Chicky. I know that. Part of this last 10 years for Chicky was him getting to know his grandsons that he never got to really meet or develop relationships with outside of prison visits or phone calls. I know that at least one of those grandsons belongs to either Joey Chang or Johnny Chang. Mm. Or sorry, I'm sorry, I'm getting either Joey Chang or Mikey Chang. I see. Uh, uh, and I believe Mikey Chang's son, um, little Mikey Chang, it has been serving as some form of driver for Chicky. But again, I want to be very clear that I don't think Chicky was very active. I understood. But I know that little Mikey Chang uh, spent a lot of time with his grandpa at Sogi Joe's and could be seen kind of taking him. Part of that just might be, I mean, I did the same thing for my grandpa at the end. Yeah. I had you to make sure he gets out of the car yeah, and doesn't, doesn't fall down. It doesn't mean it's nefarious. Right, and, right, right. Uh, um, and, and so he would have been pretty young when his dad was. Yes, he would have been a, you know, a baby. Yeah, that's sad. So, um, and I, so there's, there's a couple of ways it could happen, like in these Sicilian case studies where the vendetta just goes on. And, the, and in some cases, there's family members who won't even speak to each other because of, because of this. In other cases, they, they fall in line and, and are like, we can't change it. Yeah. This is what happened. And we got to move forward and come back together. And um, it's, it's Cosa Nostra. That's how it works. And we're not going to let that um, interfere with our sort of genealogical family. And we're going to try to make this work the best we can. You I, know? The, 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 I, I didn't finish the, the, um, what I was trying to say about the, and it's my fault. I, I got off track, but I've seen pictures of Johnny Chang. And Chicky, a number of pictures, dare I say, maybe a dozen, a dozen photos uh, over the last 10 years. I've never seen a picture of Chicky and Joey Chang. I haven't seen a picture of Johnny and Joey Chang. I don't really know where Joey Chang. And what kind of shape is he in? I don't things? know what kind of shape he's in. I don't yeah. know what his relationship is with Johnny because of Johnny's relation to Joey. Sure. Um, the FBI believes that both Joey and Mikey were the shooters. Right. Um, or possibly the shooters in, in the Joey Chang attack. Uh, so I know that there was a, a report, or I shouldn't say a report. I know that in a court file, I believe it was in a court file, that when... Nikki Scarfo was hatching this very strange oh, yeah. plot behind to bars take, take to, to, back. to somehow try to take things back in the 2000s. His delusions made him think that him and his son could rip a bank off and for like $50 million, they could, you know, buy the Philadelphia mafia back, uh, that there had been some type of overture to Joey Chang. Um, I'm not sure he was in a position. Right. To, yeah. So to, I, I, I don't know uh, what that even means or right. what that. But, you know, so uh, Chicky's been out for 10 years. I think he was, I think you could say semi-active, but he definitely wasn't active, active. And sure. I don't think he was in a, in a full administrative post, yeah. um, but he was around. Sure. Yeah. You can just Google and there's, you see pictures of him. So there's one photo. The, I think the photo that comes up first is a photo with him, Johnny Chang, and then Jerry Blavitt, the geeter with the heater, who was the famous radio disc jockey yeah. who just died recently. Is that a baseball game or something? Is that the one you're talking about? I thought I saw. Uh, no? I, th I thought it was at a bar. Oh, maybe. Well, I, yeah, whatever. Um, but Jerry Blavitt owned Memories in Margate, which is a, a very famous uh, club that everyone would, all the mob guys would hang out at. And he was known as a. In addition to being a, a big voice on oldies radio on, on, in Philadelphia, New Jersey, he was someone that, dating back to Bruno, would always take audience with mob bosses. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So I, I know that's the photo. If you put in Chicky Changalini, that's the photo that's, that's the yeah. first thing that pops yeah, up. Yeah, so he didn't lay low when he got. No, he was at, and he was at, you know, I don't know. Some of the Philadelphia reports of, of, his, of his death were afraid to name the restaurant. They, they said that he would spend his days at a South Philly bar. I apologize if if the people at Stogie Joe's take issue with with me reporting that it was Stogie Joe's. I've never really understood it, uh, other than I get it. You know, you you don't want to be labeled a place with hoodlums yeah. hanging out. But to the on the other side of the pendulum, just the kind of the smell test or the eye test in any city. Most places that are known as mob hangouts, whether it's known publicly in the press or just known on the street, are popular, successful businesses. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't affect it doesn't their tarnish business. Their, yeah, it doesn't tarnish yeah. their, yeah, tarnish their. If yeah. anything, I think people were going to Stokey Joe's the last 10 years to get a look at Chicky if yeah. he was there every day. Yeah. Um, what do you think, uh, again, all speculative, but you, you know a lot about Philly. What do you think guys like, Chicky Changalini and Joey's father in the joint were thinking of like Ralph Natale. Oh, they think they I think they were thinking it was a total joke. <laughs> that's what that's what I'm wondering. Because they knew who he was. Yeah. Right? They they were the same generation, yeah. basically. But Natale wasn't oh, he wasn't those guys were made, those guys were capos. <laughs> had, had, wait, status. And, and Natale was um I'm not trying to diminish what Ralph Natale was because he was a hitter. I mean, he was a guy that oh, yeah. did multiple he's hits. Serious gangster. Serious gangster. Um, I don't think he's anybody that if circumstances and fate hadn't played a role that he could have maneuvered his way no. into a boss's seat without having ever been made. And it wasn't like Angelo Bruno was telling people in the late, this is a guy that's going to be running the family. In, in 10 years or, that, or 15 that's, years. That's, that's my sense. Yeah. Really, the, the stars had to align right. Right. Uh, and it just so happens that Joey, and I think Ralph, I've talked to Ralph about it. Ralph claims that he manipulated the um, cellmate assignment. Mm. That he made it so Joey got put into his cell, which is possible. But Joey still had to get sent to that prison. Sure. At that time, yeah, that's back to the stars have to yeah. all line up, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for him to pull this off. Um, and I, you know, I think Joey is the ultimate mob chess player, <laughs> and he has a very non traditional style, but it's it's worked out for him. But I think he 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 was playing three steps ahead of the game the whole time when Ralph was playing it even, yeah. Uh, and, and I think that the whole time. Joey wasn't stupid. Mikey Chang weren't stupid. I mean, I, they might have believed some of what Ralph was was selling, but they knew that they were using him and that he wasn't a guy that if things would have happened in a normal protocol way would ever be in a position where it could yeah. go to the top of a crime family. No, I think, yeah, I think that has to. And be that's why. And, and, and I'm, I'm sorry about throwing out all the names. I always say this, but but that's why Long John Martirano got killed because Long John Monterado was that guy was that guy that Angelo Bruno was telling everybody yeah. in the late seventies, this is the future of the family. Yeah. And then when Long John Monterado gets out of prison after 20 years, it's if there's a debate about whether or not the rumors were true, but the rumors were that he was angling to challenge Merlino and Legambi for power. And he ended up getting knocked off and killed in an unsolved hit. Um, so again, I think if Ralph and Tally really, what was what Ralph and Tally was pretending to be, they would have just killed him. Of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Right. But they didn't need to, because he wasn't, yeah. he, he wasn't yeah. a serious uh, threat. But I do think if Ralph would have not been picked up on that parole violation in 98, I don't know if he made it. I don't know if he makes it to 99 when the, when the whole bus goes down or the whole bus went down, I think in 2000, I don't know if he makes it the year and a half. Yeah. His, his act was getting old. Yeah. I think they probably would have clipped him Especially in that time period. Merlino and those guys position becomes more solidified. Yeah. That they don't need, they don't need Natal. And the thing with the girl, you know, Ruthie, uh, again, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole because we could do a whole episode on it, but Ralph got, uh, 
let a, a girlfriend of his who was a, a street corner pal of Joey and his crew, uh, 30 years younger than Ralph, and, and she twisted him around her finger. And by the time Ralph got picked up, she was puppeteering the, the boss of the Philadelphia mob and like publicly embarrassing him. Uh, right. There was a situation where she slapped him in public. And that just, uh, I wouldn't have been shocked if they killed both of them. If, if, if Ralph doesn't get picked up, they find a way and they kill Ralph and Ruthie. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't go over in that yeah. world symbolically. But uh, R.I.P. Chicky, I, I don't want to. I don't want to be um, insensitive to uh, uh, you know to, to victims' families, and and uh, I always try to thread a needle between glorifying. You know, people have this impression that we're glorifying these people or or propping them up as heroes. And I, I I don't view it like that. I I view it as history, and you know. Uh, History, historical analysis in, in, in our research and whatnot, I, I don't want, because, you know, besides the four murders that they suspect him playing a role in, I would guess that he probably played a role in other murders. And so you have lots of families and victims and who knows what they're consuming about this guy's death. So I don't want to come off as insensitive about that. But, you know, in the world that we study and in the stuff that we report on, uh, Chicky Changalini was a very, very big deal whose legacy will uh, ring loud in, in South Philly from here to eternity. Yeah, it's um, it, it's uh, I was just thinking about something you said. It's when you do a show like this and you look at some of the comments, you get you get uh, criticized from both ends. You'll, you'll, yeah. it, in the same episode, you'll see a criticism that says oh we're glorifying these guys romanticizing them and in the same episode you'll see someone saying that we're dry snitching and we shouldn't be talking yeah. about this and we're too friendly with the cops and like you can't you can't win uh and like i've said before we're not team uncle sam we're not team lcn we're we're team og podcast we're just trying to tell interesting stories and talk about compelling people my, my closing two we, don't, we don't have a we don't, we don't have a side my closing two cents and just playing the what if game is that Again, if things go differently, I, I could see Chicky Changalini becoming boss of this family after yeah. Scarfo goes uh, by the wayside. And the, the Changalini mob dynasty could have played out a lot different if Chicky's on the street with the three sons. Well, he probably would have been a good boss. Yeah, and I think he, I think he would have been a guy that uh, would have been like a, a Joe Legambi, yes, who who came in and uh, after Molina went to prison as an acting boss and as a conciliary, conciliary and was you know to me Joe Joe Legambi is like the 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 underrated superstar of the American mafia in the 21st century. And it's a guy that you would have at least I would have never predicted um, would be one of the top bosses of the new millennium and and. Uh, you know, he gets an A plus report card from yeah, me and what he's done really, with that family and really stabilized. Things. And and Chicky, I think, would have been very similar in terms of the respect that he uh, was afforded uh, outside of Philadelphia, within Philadelphia. Um, he was a guy that uh, commanded a room, wasn't loud and ostentatious like like Scarfo or, or Merlino. Yeah. Um, someone that with the you know. Like a Carlo Gambino, like with the nod of the head, the nod of his head, you know, people, you know, <laughs> snap to attention. Yeah, yeah, that, that's my understanding. Do you want to at least mention some of the other? Oh yeah, so passed on uh, in up? this past week, uh, three other uh, mob buttons died. We're gonna do a a more exhaustive, comprehensive episode on Nikki Slim Calabrese who died, I think, the same day that Chicky died. Uh, Nikki Calabrese was a, a soldier in the Chicago Mafia, the only member of the Chicago Mafia to ever flip. He was the star witness in Family Secrets, participated in the, the murders that were shown in the movie Casino. And I am lining up an interview with uh, the FBI agents that flipped him, uh, that worked the outfit for 30 years, and get him to come on and talk about the mafia bus that rocked the Windy City. Uh, will, they, will they answer our questions about Jimmy I, you think? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Okay. <laughs> uh, so look for that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and then 
in New Jersey, a longtime capo, uh, 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 Paul Farina, who went by the nickname uh, uh, Pauly Figs because he used to plant fig trees, uh, was not, died at 96 years old, got named capo in 1965. Wow. Became a, uh, a ruling board member in the late 90s, early 2000s, married his daughter off to uh, the boss of New Jersey in the 2000s and 2010s, Frank Garacci. And uh, he, he died a couple of weeks ago, a uh, teamster, sorry, not not a teamster. He was a um, a labor union official that was longshoreman or something. I think it was eight. I think it was H. Uh, Hod Carrier. I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna get roasted oh. by Hud H H O D or H U D H O D. I don't know. Hud Carrier A C D. I don't. Know. I'm sorry. It's been a long day. <laughs> uh, but he he was uh, known as. Um, in New Jersey as a guy that would liaison for De Calvicante and De Calvicante's successor, uh, John the Eagle uh, Riggi, uh, Riggi, uh, with uh, labor problems that were going on with other families. So there was a lot of surveillance reports from the 70s and 80s with uh, guys coming in from Chicago, uh, Detroit, Cleveland, St. Louis, Milwaukee, that were doing a labor business that uh, Pauly Farina would meet with and, and help smooth, smooth things out. Uh, he was the the business agent for, for the local, local there. Uh, so he passed away. And then Johnny Glorioso, who went by the nickname Johnny Glory or Harry Johns, uh, Kansas City mob, Mafia OG, drug lieutenant, very close to the two guys that are alleged to run the Kansas City Mafia now, Johnny Joe Shortino and uh, Las Vegas Pete Simone. I think they were in a dinner group together. They would, they would dine on a regular basis. Uh, Glorioso was a Convicted marijuana, cocaine, methamphetamine dealer. Did five years in the feds in the 90s. And uh, he passed away this week as well. Okay, well, uh, we uh, appreciate everyone sticking around and listening to us and watching us. And again, please subscribe. And we look forward to bringing you more content in the future. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. For Scott Bernstein. We're out. Peace.